Hello, reading friend, and thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend some time with Double Indemnity by James M. Cain. This book was originally published in story form uh, like 1935-1936, and this novella with a couple of other novellas published in book form from what I could tell reading up on the publication history in 1943. I read not too long ago Mildred Pierce, also by James M. Cain, and I will link to that chat down uh, below. But I wanted to read this one as well. Uh, Double Indemnity was, like Mildred Pierce, adapted into a film. Double Indemnity, the film, came out in 1944, I believe, and was directed by Billy Wilder and started, starred Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. The screenplay for, for the film was co-written by Billy Wilder and none other than Raymond Chandler, the sort of hardball detective fiction writer from the same era, and I've read a couple of his books, uh, The Big Sleep, as well as Farewell, My Lovely, and I will link to those chats down in the details as well. But this is a noir, I'm calling this noir fiction, also sort of psychological thriller from this period. I will be very careful not to uh, give away any spoilers during this chat. I don't want to talk about anything that I think would detract from a first-time reader's experience with Double Indemnity. The film version, though, if you haven't seen it, I do recommend it. Um, the book is a little bit different. I'm not going to talk about the differences between the book and the film in this chat, but um, it, ends, it ends a bit differently, um, but they're both very enjoyable. All right, so what is this one about? You know, we have this main character, Walter Huff, who is an insurance salesman. He's a very good insurance salesman. He's been doing it a long time, and he's really one of the top uh, salesmen, you know, in his company. And he goes to the home one day. Um, this is in L.A. Um, of, uh, of Mr. A man named Mr. Nerdlinger. And Mr. Nerdlinger is not home. Mr. Nerdlinger has a policy uh, with Walter Huff's company. Mr. Nerdlinger is not home, but his wife Phyllis is. So Walter meets Phyllis, and they immediately sort of have a sort of um, a connection. Walter feels very attracted to her and is drawn back and, um, you know, uh, goes back trying to ultimately trying to renew this policy and I think actually expand the policy into something else at first. Starts off, you know, in this sort of like innocent way, but ultimately it turns into a plot to kill Phyllis's husband, Mr. Neerdlinger, and collect double indemnity, collect the insurance money. Double indemnity refers to when an insurance company pays double for a certain type of event, like uh, in the case of this book, like a train accident. So I won't go into exactly what all happens here, but Walter is drawn, Walter and Phyllis uh, is drawn into this plot. Um, and, you know, that's sort of where the story takes off from there. So some other characters in the book, um, Walter's boss, Keyes. So Keyes is the, uh, I guess, like a manager of the insurance company. And so the insurance company, Keyes does investigation. So any kind of claim, especially a big claim with the company, gets an investigation, right? And so to determine, you know, if it's a legitimate claim or not. And so the, the, the insurance company, um, hires detectives and things to sort of investigate independent of the police. And so Keyes is a type of person who will not let anything suspicious go. And so Keyes is very suspicious. A lot of, of, of this book is actually written as a form of almost confession from Walter to Keyes. Um, so that's sort of how the book is structured. But Keyes is, um, you know, very sort of astute and can sort of sense when there's been some sort of fraud. Some other characters in the book are Lola, who is the daughter of Mr. Neerdlinger's stepdaughter of Phyllis, and then her boyfriend, who is possibly a sort of ne'er-do-well uh, fella named uh, Nino Sarchetti. Sarchetti. Uh, we don't know if there's something going on with Sarchetti, especially at first. Um, 
But, you know, in typical sort of noir fashion, some of our characters have more of a backstory than we know up front at first. I'll just say it that way. Um, so, yeah, those are the main characters um, involved here in this little short novella. This book is only about 115 pages. This print version, I read 115 pages here. So I read this in a couple of sittings, but there was a lot of story packed into this, this little novella. Uh, yeah, uh, and quite a thriller. So one thing that my key takeaway from the book was why did Walter do, why did Walter get involved with this plot? Um, because he's a successful insurance uh, salesman. He doesn't particularly need money. And so why did he, you know, and he's a very savvy person. So why did he get involved with, uh, with this? Is it because of, um, you know, sort of his love slash lust of Phyllis? I don't know. You know, later in the, in the novella, we, we sort of see some of his other emotional attachments. So we feel, I got the impression that his, his, uh, his sort of, his affection could be fairly fluid. I mean, who he's supposedly in love with. So I don't know. It seems like there's a mixture of things that are motivating uh, Walter. But to me, that was kind of the, one of the more interesting things about this, this uh, novella was trying to uncover why is Walter, why did Walter do this? Or why was he, um, why did he get involved this way? And there is a quote from the book that I thought I would read that I think sort of might help explain that. And it's sort of at the beginning here. And Walter is talking to, I believe he's talking to here, uh, Phyllis. And they're talking about the insurance business. And he says, you think I'm nuts. All right, maybe I am. But you spend 15 years in the business I'm in and maybe you'll go nuts yourself. You think it's a business, don't you? Just like your business. And maybe a little better than that because it's the friend of the widow, the orphan, and the needy in time of trouble. It's not. It's the biggest gambling wheel in the world. It don't look like it, but it is. From the way they figure the percentage on the double zero to the look on their face when they cash your chips. You bet that your house will burn down. They bet it won't. That's all. What fools you is that you don't, didn't want your house to burn down when you made the bet. And so you forget it's a bet. They don't. Uh, that don't fool them. To them, a bet is a bet. Um, and a hedge bet don't look any different than any other bet. But there comes a time, maybe, when you do want your house to burn down. When the money is worth more than the house. And right there is where the trouble starts. So I think, you know, he's saying here, the insurance business is kind of a gambling racket. And they're gambling that this is not going to happen to you. And you're, you're gambling that it will happen to you. Um, and it's sort of this gambling game at first, but then, you know, there's can be other things um, can then arise where the customer then ultimately would decide, hey, there's a way I could get this money when the money becomes more attractive than the bet. And so then you start trying to game the system. I'm wondering, you know, my sort of take on it is that part of what drew Walter into this scheme is that um, he wanted to see if he could game the system like he's a very good salesman he understands this business really well and so yes he wanted to see well you know he kind of wanted to see up front at the beginning if he could if he, you know if he could get if he could game the system because he knows all the tricks right he thinks and so that's part of it i think i think he didn't realize he was also getting gamed um uh, by others involved. Um, and so, you know, I think this might happen a lot of times when people start going down these roads, they think they're in control of the situation. Um, but then maybe they're not as in control as, as they think. Um, but it's just a really uh, sort of thrilling ride in a really relatively uh, few amount of pages, uh, really a lot of story packed in here. I'm not going to give away, I don't think, anything else around this story because I don't want to, like I said, detract from uh, the journey, little journey we go on with these characters and this sort of plot and how it plays out. Um, I will leave that in case uh, the 
viewer here decides they want to read this book and I don't definitely don't want to give it away um, the film is a little different so if you were to see the film before you read the book um, the it's a, it, it ends a little differently so as I as I mentioned all right, I think I will leave the chat for Double Indemnity with that. I will be reading some more James M. Cain. Um, he wrote The Postman Always Rings Twice, which I've always wanted to read. That was also adapted into a noir film, film noir. And I've always wanted to read the book itself just to see what the book was like. The books, uh, so far the James M. Cain books are a little different than the films, um, of course, uh, as is often the case. So um, I definitely enjoyed this brief read of Double Indemnity. Okay, what is my next? My next chat is going to be switching gears into some nonfiction, some history of Ravenna, the city in Italy, cru capital of empire, crucible of Europe by Judith Heron. This is involving Ravenna from about 402 AD up until about the 800s. Uh, this period of time where the late the Rome Rome is ending in the West and being replaced in power by the Byzantine Empire from Constantinople and Ravenna, sort of a seat of power during this time, both for the Empire in Constantinople as well as um, the uh, Christian Church. So, um, very interesting read. I am almost finished with this. I should have a chat on this coming up very soon. And then finally, if you like cool uh, book shirts, be sure and check out my Teespring store. I will put a link down in the details below so you can get uh, this shirt and others like it if you're into cool bookish-themed t-shirts. So, that's it for now. Until next time, take care. Bye.